Um, so you can, you're here from Silicon Valley, and before we dive into the future, I want to kind of look at the current moment. And we all know what the markets are doing. We all know tech valuations are plummeting. Give people here a kind of vibe check of what you're hearing in Silicon Valley, where the investment is, have things dried up? If they haven't dried up, where is the energy and investment going? Well, first, every firm is different. So you can go shopping for an attitude. Us as a firm, if we invest in something, we know we're not getting liquidity for five, maybe 10 years. So if I can't predict the market in 2030, the market's mostly irrelevant to me. Um, there is less hype today, so valuations are more attractive. That's good for us, not so good for entrepreneurs. But there's something else that's very good. Uh, used to be a year ago, if something got funded, there'd be five competitors funded right away. And then they'd spend all their money on marketing dollars competing with each other. So the efficiency of capital use by entrepreneurs was very poor. And that's really going to help entrepreneurs. I think the good entrepreneurs will get to the same stage with a lot less money raised because their competitors aren't spending as much. And, and that ties into something else. Part of the themes we've heard during this market downturn was, well, let's look back at the other downturn. Let's look back at 2008. And Airbnb was created in 2008. This is the chance for the next Airbnb to come up. Are you seeing that yet? I, I think we are. So the good news for the entrepreneurs in the audience, <laughs> uh, Google isn't hiring a lot of people. Google isn't letting people rest and invest anymore with the large cash packages. So you can build much better teams. And I think that's really good news. In this environment, team building becomes easier, in my view. For if you're backed by the really good venture firms, you will build better teams, stronger teams, and the best, most creative people at the big companies. You know, whether it's Meta or Snap or somebody else, they discontinued those advanced projects that are trying to do radical things. And those are exactly the people who can help entrepreneurs. So that's a much better sort of team building opportunity for most people. So how soon we're seeing some of those big tech firms, you mentioned Snap just laid off 1,200 people. How long before we see those former employees from the Snaps and Metas of the world start making their own startups? Or is that happening already? That's happening already. Both our companies can hire better, but there's also just brand new entrepreneurs, brand new startups that have some ambitious vision that suddenly got cut short. And I think uh, that's exciting. Uh, for, for the an entrepreneurial ecosystem, what I would say is the next five years is going to be a very rich time for opportunities. It may be a little harder to raise money in the short term, but I have not seen it be hard for really differentiated startups. I think the undifferentiated ones will have a harder time. The really differentiated ones, plenty of opportunity. If you have a large technology breakthrough that's hard to cop copy, you're going to have an advantage. I think those things really matter. So let's talk about that. That's what we're here to talk about the next five or 10 years. I know climate is one of the areas that you look in, climate, green tech, and so on. You were doing that about 15 years ago, probably didn't turn out as well as you had wanted 15 years ago. Fast forward to today, what is different now and what is resonating now in, in these technologies that you're investing in? And so first I would challenge you that <laughs> things that started 10, 15 years ago did well if you as an investor were thoughtful about what you were investing. You didn't chase, chase the hype. So QuantumScape is a company, if you own the solid state battery business, you're going to build a business worth hundreds of billions of dollars. We are very happy with the returns to date. It's already a very large return for us, even at today's depressed valuations. And it's much higher than it was three years ago. Mm. Um, so really good turnout. Lanza Tech's doing jet fuel, low carbon jet fuel. That's a very good business. Impossible Foods, really good business. These are all sustainability plays from what people call clean tech 1.0. But the valuation for Impossible 
10 years ago because plant proteins wasn't a word, was single digit millions. And now it's single digit billions, that works. <clears throat> no matter how you do the math, that return works. So I would challenge people to say CleanTech 1.0 didn't work out if you were thoughtful. If you were an investor in Tesla, you did great. Yeah. In any fund, you know, out of 50 investments, two or three will account for 90% of the returns. And if you made the right kinds of investments in CleanTech 1.0, you did really, really well. So 2.0, where are they going? <laughs> 2.0, we are investors in Commonwealth Fusion Systems. You know, and frankly, four or five years ago, people thought it was crazy to invest in Fusion. Now it's the fashion. But I think it makes a lot of sense because this market is much larger than the market for Google or Facebook, right? Ad markets. It's a much bigger market, so there's much bigger outcomes to be had. Uh, these are multi-trillion dollar markets, so that's a good example. Forterra is our cement, low carbon cement company. Huge opportunity. One of my favorite new ones, only 10 people. They make fertilizer, which is a major societal dependence mm -hmm. on fertilizer still used with a process from the eight, uh, 19th century, the 1800s, Haber-Bosch process. Almost all the fertilizers produced this way. They make fertilizer out of thin air. Literally, they take solar power, air and water, and nothing else. And when lightning strikes in nature, it produces nitric acid, which produces fertilizer. That's how fertilizer used to be done before the Haber-Bosch process. They put lightning in a bottle from the solar panels, and they have no inputs to their plant, none. Now, very high-risk project. If it works out, awesome. Massive transformation on more than a 100-year-old business. If it doesn't, we lose a little bit of money, no big deal. So, Lots of very large opportunities. Mighty buildings, 3D printing buildings with no steel, no cement, no wood. Now think about building multifamily, single family and multifamily housing. If you could reduce the carbon footprint by 80% or more, and you could cut, cut the cost of construction in half. Trillion dollar market. So these are massive markets. And to be clear, a lot of this isn't necessarily creating new forms of energy or using solar. It's how do we do something more traditional and lower our footprint. Is that correct? No. It's to say take a carbon intensive market that's very, very large mm -hmm. and disrupt it with lower cost and lower, lower carbon footprint. Right. You know, we have something in hydrogen. We even have a public transit company trying to build a brand new kind of public transit system. Whoever heard about it, but frankly, 10 years ago when we invested in Impossible, that sounded crazy. Mm. But I wanna make, since you probably have an audience from many, many different disciplines, climate's a very vibrant area, but I wanna make the point that five years ago, I looked at what should I work on next? I was, I turned 60, so what should I work on next? And I looked at all parts of the US non-governmental GDP, and I was shocked to find that every part of GDP has room for technology-based innovation that would result in hundreds of percent, not this five, 10 percent, common improvements in traditional industry, hundreds of percent in almost every area of the GDP. If it was education, you could do AI tutors. If it was medicine, you could do AI-based doctors. Um, if it was therapeutics, you had completely new approaches to cell therapy. Um, if you had AI and robotics, you could invert the supply chain from China. Absolutely critical. So, whether we looked at construction or public transit or climate or education or fintech, um, <clears throat> there was massive opportunity in fintech. One of my, there's a lot of crypto at this conference. One of my favorite projects we did four or five years ago was, <coughs> excuse me, helium. Now, why is helium different than most crypto? 
because most crypto, which we don't do a lot of, is crypto for the crypto world, crypto investors. That, to me, is a very different market than using the blockchain to disrupt massive parts of the current U.S. economy. If, if Helium can build a low bandwidth network, which they've already built, um, that competes with AT&T, that's great. Next, they've announced they're looking at 5G. If you could build a 5G carrier with blockchain technology and tokens, it's massively disruptive. Well, explain how that works, because as I understand it, if you want to build a 5G carrier, that's a very capital-intensive process in the hundreds of billions of dollars. How does, what, is, what does that mean? You're just a blockchain 5G network. What does that literally so mean? So what Helium did is people can get by their own access points, participate in the network, earn tokens, mm. and the earlier you participate, the more to token value you get, which is the whole advantage of the blockchain. You can create network effects which would be very hard to create any other way because you're incentivizing with tokens the early participants. So if you built your own access point to participate in the network, now Helium has more access points than AT&T does, but none of it is their capital. So that's the kind of really great opportunity in crypto. So Hive Mapper is trying to build a Google Maps with group participation and you earn tokens for contributing. And the earlier you participate in this, the better you're going to be if the project is successful. So there are a lot of really valuable uses of impacting, of using the blockchain and the crypto world to impact the mainstream economy, not crypto for crypto's sake, which is a different market, and we haven't played in that a whole lot. Yeah, so what, I guess that's why I want to talk about, I mean, you are in a firm which is probably one of your most public-facing fintech yep. plays. And I know what you're going to tell me, but I'm going to ask it anyway. It's, mm -hmm. They've been having a rough year valuation-wise. They're about to face very stiff and deep-pocketed competition from Apple launching a competing product. And I know you're going to tell me, well, they have the best credit checking technology in the world, and this is where their real opportunity lies. Why are investors missing that? Well, investors look at quarter to quarter. We look in multi-year increments. So if you so take... So five years, a firm is going to be what? Well, the market for a firm, a firm doesn't care about Apple. Uh, and a firm's not really in the BNPL space. A firm's in the consumer lending space. And who are the big players waiting to be eaten? Visa and MasterCard. They are the biggest lenders. So we have a firm in the consumer lending space in the Visa MasterCard business with a much better proposition for consumers. They have to execute, and every company has to execute. But this is, they have single digit penetration into the consumer lending space the way I look at the market. And that creates this massive opportunity and growth opportunity. You know, whether it's 30% down or up a quarter, almost is irrelevant to is there a 10x opportunity or a 100x opportunity in the space for revenue, not market cap. Market caps are mostly emotional things, right? Right. So that's an example. Let me take another example. GitLab is a company we have in the uh, DevOps space software development. The category didn't exist a few years ago when we invested. It wasn't called DevOps. Today, yeah, GitLab's down a little bit from its peak, but it's way higher than it was a year ago, or two years ago, before the IPO, as is a firm, by the way, before the IPO. Um, but it's single-digit penetration into software development, which is a massive opportunity. So if somebody has the winning horse in the race, uh, and you could place your bet very early in the race, you have lots of headroom. I don't really care what happens to the stock price. But the same is true in the private markets. You know, we have a company called Avon, uh, home equity lines of credit. Everything in that space I find scammy, right? It's traditional players with obsolete infrastructure trying to mostly scam consumers. Mm. Avon's view is every consumer will have 
a much lower cost of capital, and they will limit the amount of capital because in home equity, you can look at total debt to make it affordable for the consumer. Be responsible for the consumer and lead with consumer first. By the way, same metric as a firm. Mm. They don't charge late fees. They don't charge all this other nonsense that confuses consumers and reduces trust. Right? They're super transparent, which is the way to build brands, whether it's a private company like Avon or a public company like a firm. The best brands are built over time by doing trustworthy things. And I think those things will win. And uh, frankly, the traditional players have no idea how to do brand building with trust and transparency. And frankly, most of FinTech, their principal business model is the fine print. Find a way to charge you late fees or ding you here or ding you there or that extra surcharge. When fine print becomes the principal business model for most of traditional FinTech, it's ripe for innovation. And traditional fintech is also the big opportunity for the blockchain. And, and that's what I want to talk about. So we have, we've talked about blockchain, fintech, and climate. Let's just call those the three buckets we talked about. There are a lot of things going on geopolitically right now mm -hmm. that impact directly all three of those things. On the climate front, we have the Russia-Ukraine issue, and we have even President Biden saying we need to drill more. On the fintech and blockchain side, we have Gary Gensler of the SEC looking into it. We have the IRA passing, yep. which is a huge climate bill. What are the drawbacks and benefits you're seeing on so, each of so those? Let me answer the question yeah. a little differently. I think we in the West are in a major techno-economic war with China. And it's a good thing because if, the, if multiple parties are playing, Globally, everybody Are will do better. Are they playing fair? Fair or not, everybody globally will do well. Mm -hmm. So I actually think this techno-economic war, which is what will turn into influence and culture and a lot of other things, is very, very important for us to win because at least I want Western values to win. No question about it. Um, and in that sense, the two best things that have happened, to come to your question, one is the Russian war, and the other is COVID. We can't be dependent on the supply chain on China. Absolutely a high strategic imperative at the pol national policy level. We can't trust entities like Russia, who randomly decide to, it'd be great if they're humiliated, which I hope they are. Um, but they've done the world a huge favor. There's no longer Germany can trust Russia mm -hmm. and won't be held hostage. That fallacy is gone, and that's a huge contribution Putin made to the Western world. Don't trust me, don't trust others, be independent. And the values-based world is different than the non-values-based world, which is different than China, which is not a non-values-based world, it's really a different political philosophy and a legitimate one at that, but very different than ours, and I want ours to win. So in the last few seconds, you mentioned China, and this has been a popular topic over the last 10 days or so in the tech world, these concerns over TikTok and whether or not it should be banned. In this war yes. that you called it, you say yes, why? We cannot be dependent on influencing. You know, what the tech world Influence has, from the CCP. Yeah. What we have learned is China does influence its companies. It's part of their political economic system. And we, if your country likes that, great, allow TikTok. If you don't like that, we know these social networking apps have learned how to manipulate human brains in massive ways. And if we have learned to do that, would we trust the Chinese government not to influence TikTok? They may not. I'm not saying they are influencing it. But there's no I'm guarantee. saying we cannot have that dependency, just like we cannot have supply chain dependency from China to here. And so we have to do local manufacturing or invert the supply chain, which is entirely possible with a powerful technology like AI and robotics. I should have mentioned the CHIPS Act as part of the recent legislation. The CHIPS too. Act, are, uh, all these are massive 
wins when it comes to moving to the place we need to get to in the next 10 years and get independence. And the more independence we have, the, the more not only freedom we will have, the more better relations we will have with China, which would in general be a good thing. So we, but we can't rely on trust alone, as we have learned. I think that's a good spot. So lesson here, don't invest in a Chinese social media app from the Co Chinese Communist Party. That's the first one. Well, I'm and not <laughs> saying that. No, I'm saying we shouldn't be dependent on it to engage our kids for four hours a day. Right. Right. That's great. Vinod, thank you so much for joining us. Thank, thank you, you, everybody.